In this video, we're going to discuss some concepts and also the mechanism of what's called the Hoffman elimination of amines. So the idea behind an elimination is we have the leaving group on the molecule and it leaves. Done. It leaves behind a pi bond, so you end up creating pi bonds in these elimination reactions, but ultimately it's the same type of elimination reaction as you learned in Organic Chemistry 1. The difference is, in this chapter, the leaving group is going to be a nitrogen. Ultimately, we're going to make an amine leave. Now, we'll walk through the mechanism for how that pi bond forms and how the leaving group leaves, but just knowing that the nitrogen is going to be your leaving group should be a little bit disconcerting, because if this nitrogen took these electrons and left the molecule, it would be really unstable. It would have two lone pairs, and a full negative charge. And you might recognize that as a really strong base. It's kind of related to LDA, lithium diisopropylamide, if you replaced the two hydrogens with isopropyl groups. And also, you use this very base in organic chemistry 1 to rip off hydrogens, the hydrogens of terminal alkynes. Now, if that sounds like a foreign language, I encourage you to, to watch a couple of the videos I made for the organic chemistry 1 class that in, that talk about that. But long story short, this is a very unstable molecule. It's an extremely strong base, very unstable, and so a terrible leaving group. Well, we had these big dreams. We had dreams of making the amine leave, and what have they become? We have to turn, in order to achieve our goal, to fulfill our mission, we have to turn the amine into a better leaving group. And luckily, there's a trick up our sleeves. There's a way for us to do that. Whenever you see an amine, you always want to see that lone pair there that determines its reactivity so much. Both as a base, true, but also, and crucially, as a nucleophile. What if we treated that with, oh, I don't know, a carbon molecule with an amazing leaving group on it. And when I say amazing, I mean like this is about as, as intense as single atom leaving groups can get. Iodine. Iodine is the biggest of the halogens, and therefore it leaves molecules like you won't believe. It takes these electrons, spreads them out, dilutes their charge over so much space that, uh, that it, it just leaves immediately. It's a very good leaving group. Let's leave it at that. So what happens is, if we treat this with methyl iodide, then this lone pair on the nitrogen will do an SN2 reaction. Backside attack. It'll attack that carbon, kick the iodine leaving group off. And truly, how much persuasion did that iodine really need? Let's be real. It was going to pop off the molecule almost by itself. So what we end up with here is something that at first glance might not seem like a big achievement. We end up with... Um, the iodine leaving, so that's gone, living its best life somewhere in the container. And then we end up with a bond between the nitrogen and the carbon. So we have that new bond there. Now notice that the nitrogen has four bonds. To make that a little clearer, I'm going to draw the bonds to those hydrogens. So, so notice this nitrogen has four bonds to it. And that means it has a full positive charge. Full positive charge. So it's a positive ion. The iodine that left would have taken electrons and become a, a full negative ion. And so that might stick around here just because it's attracted to that positive charge. And it'll stabilize it a little bit. Okay, well, interesting. Now, in the presence of, in, if this happens, and you, and remember, we show just one of each of these molecules here, but in a beaker, you've got hundreds of millions of trillions of them. You've got almost innumerable numbers of these things. And an interesting hap thing happens here. Um, once this nitrogen gets a taste of these carbons, it kind of just can't stop. It's going to keep doing this SN2 reaction. Now, the, the explanation behind that is that, remember, these are sort of sp three orbitals here, and those can donate electron density into the nitrogen in a way that the hydrogens can't, right? 
Uh, we've seen this in like stabilizing carbocations. The more carbons you have around them, the more they stabilize the positive charge because they donate electron density toward the nitrogen. So the carbon groups are kind of like electron donating groups. And so they, they, they sort of make that nitrogen more reactive, or at least they will in just a second. Because right now they would stabilize it, but another amine, oops, another amine molecule can come along and do a proton transfer. Take a hydrogen off, that stabilizes our, our first amine. And what we have at the end of there is just a stabilized a stabilized amine. No more positive charge. Instead, crucial lone pair. And the iodine would have gone over to this other amine that took the H+. And so they would live, go off and live happily together. So at this point, what we've done is we've replaced one of the, one of the, um, we've replaced one of the hydrogens on this amine with a methyl group by treating it with methyl iodide. But there's still more methyl iodide in the container, and this is now even more reactive than the original amine was. Right? This was reactive enough to do this SN2 reaction. This new amine that we have is going to be even more reactive because, it's, because it has this electron donating methyl group with all the electrons flying around there, so many more than the hydrogen, and so they push electron density closer to the nitrogen and make this even more reactive. So you are unable to just add one alkyl group to your amine. Instead, you add a second, and then you'll see, not to spoiler alert, we're going to add a third, and then a fourth. So this does another SN2 reaction, kicks the iodine off. I'm going to ignore the, well, no, I won't ignore the iodine. Okay, so now what we have after this step, oops, what we have after that next step is that lone pair will form a new bond to the CH3. Notice that the nitrogen now has four bonds, and so a full positive charge. And the iodine would have gone off with a negative charge as a leaving group, but that negative charge is attracted to the positive charge on this nitrogen here. So it sort of sticks around because it's attracted to that. Well, another mean can come along just like before. And this next amine can do a proton transfer just like before. And the electrons can snap back onto the nitrogen in order to in order to stabilize the positive charge on that. And when you do that, When you do that, you end up with first no hydrogen on this nitrogen, and therefore no positive charge, and instead a hydrogen on the other amine, and now that has the positive charge. And so the iodine is attracted to that, and these go off and live their happy lives, probably befriending the previous group that did the exact same thing, and forming a small community. In the meantime, this nitrogen has another lone pair back, and what do you think is going to happen now? We've got these electron donating groups, now we've got two of them. This nitrogen is feeling the heat, all the electrons around it pushing against it. These lone pair, this lone pair wants to steal something, and so we have plenty of this methyl iodide floating around in solution. And so once again, we have an SN2 reaction. The lone pair attacks the the carbon and the methyl iodide, and the iodine pops right off. So what we have at the end of that is an interesting molecule. 
So we'll be able to, we've been climbing this mountain, the mountain of this mechanism for a little while. We're going to, we're gonna reach a plateau in just a second and take a survey of the, what we've accomplished of the view all around us. So this, I'm gonna write that hydrogen on the other side. And here, we're gonna have that new bond between these. And the iodine would have taken its electrons and have a full negative charge. Oh, and the nitrogen, very importantly, has four bonds and therefore a full positive charge. And the nitrogen, the iodine, I'm sorry, is attracted to the nitrogen and sort of stabilizes the positive charge on it. Okay, so now what have we accomplished? We have co accomplished something, and this now you'll be, you'll be able to learn this important term that shows up a lot in chemical literature. We have formed what is called a quaternary ammonium salt. Quaternary ammonium salt. These are actually really useful in the laboratory, and especially if you ever want to extract um, interesting molecules from plants, you can often do it by forming these quaternary ammonium salts. Quaternary, quaternary, that's referring to the fact that the nitrogen is bonded to four different groups. One, two, three, four. Quaternary. Likewise, ammonium, that means that it's not just anything that's bonded to four different groups, it is a nitrogen. Remember, ammonia, with an A at the end, is NH3, if you have one more bond than NH3 does, then you become an ammonium ion. Finally, this is called a salt because it is an ionic compound. The positive charge on the nitrogen is being stabilized by the negative charge on the iodine, and salt in organic chemistry, or in any chemistry, in, in fact, just the word salt means any ionic compound. So not just table salt. Table salt is what salt is for someone who lives in that tiny, narrow, restricted world of peop that people live in who don't know any chemistry. Once you learn chemistry, you realize there are hundreds of salts. Any ionic compound is a salt. So what we formed here is a quaternary ammonium salt. And so this is useful because this positive charge should remind you of other things that became good leaving groups when they have a positive charge. Now, wait a second. Do you remember many moons ago we started talking about an elimination reaction? That's what's like <laughs> the whole goal of this. Well, if we treat this first with excess, and really a lot of steps, right? Excess methyl iodide, then what we do is we can change our amine into a quaternary ammonium salt. The amine has a positive charge, and that would make it a good leaving group, except that the iodine is stabilizing it. Compare, for example, we've had OHs before, and they were bad leaving groups, and we've had to do a proton transfer so that they'd have that positive charge that makes them a good leaving group so that they can leave as water. We'll, we'll see that again in the, in the next video on the mechanism for making diazonium uh, ions. So that positive charge is a sign that we could potentially use this as a good leaving group now and finally do our elimination reactions. The only problem is iodine is stabilizing it. And so long as it's stable, it's not going to want to leave the molecule. So we have to steal iodine away. We have to give it something else that it can be attracted to. Something like, oh, I don't know, silver. Because silver is a positive ion, and it sticks to iodine very, very hard. It sticks to it very, very hard, forms silver iodide, and that is, they stick to each other so much that it is not soluble in water. I can prove it to you. Now, if, if I say that, silver iodide is not soluble in water, and you say, all right, chief, whatever you say, then I have not taught you science correctly, because the whole point of science is to approach everybody, what everybody says with distrust, to demand to see things for yourself, and to understand things for yourself. This is silver iodide, silver iodide uh, mixed in water. And so you can see it's not dissolving, it's precipitating out of the water. And so if we mix some silver ions in there, oops, if we mix some silver ions in there, then um, they'll stick to the iodine 
the iodine will be coaxed away. Oops, the iodine will get coaxed away. And now the nitrogen finally, after so much effort and so many moons, now the nitrogen becomes a good leaving group. All we need to do an elimination reaction is a base. Now, it would be nice if we could come up with a base that had silver in it, because then we'd be killing two birds with one stone. Sprinkle the base in, the silver will steal the iodine, and then the base will do the elimination reaction in the way that we're going to talk about in a second. Well, what if I told you there is such a base, and the base is silver oxide? And it should be two silver ions. So Ag2O, silver oxide. And you might be looking at that and, and saying, well, I guess I can, I can see how you get the silver there. Where's the base? Well, this is an ionic compound that is soluble in water. So really, what this looks like is 2 minus, and we've got two silvers with a plus charge. And those are canceling each other out, all those charges. So where's the base? I'll show you where the base is. What's the conjugate base of water? Take a hydrogen away and a plus charge, and you have hydroxide. What's the conjugate base of hydroxide? Take a hydrogen away and a plus charge, and you have this base right here. So we can sprinkle silver oxide in, Ag2O, and that kills two birds with one stone. If we Mix that in. The silver will coax away the iodine, making this a good leaving group. And if we mix this with water, then the oxygen, which is really unstable, will do a proton transfer from the water, turn into hydroxide. And now that can act as the base to do the elimination reaction. Okay. Now. Now, if you're not comfortable with anything about eliminations, if I say the word elimination and you're like, I've never heard that word before in my life, um, then I, I very strongly encourage you to do some review with the videos I made for the Organic Chemistry 1 class. I've made some videos just explaining the concept behind eliminations and what you need and how it works. So those videos might be really useful to you if you don't know anything about eliminations. But for now, I'm going to assume that you at least know the basic concept behind eliminations. You need a leaving group, you need a base, and what happens is the, the carbon that has the leaving group on it in the context of elimination reactions is called an alpha carbon. Now, don't be confused. That's not the same thing as an alpha carbon next to a carbonyl. Although they are both called alpha carbons, they are very different things. And so this alpha carbon is the one that has this leaving group on it, and any carbon next to it is called a beta carbon. Now, the beta carbons are the ones whose hydrogens can get stolen by a base. And when they do, when they do, then uh, they kick the leaving group off, as we shall see. So these two beta hydrogens are the ones that the base could potentially steal. Now normally, in organic chemistry one, you said, okay, well, either of those will get stolen. In fact, every time you do an elimination, some mixture, of, you know, you'd get both of those getting stolen. You'd always get a mixture. But your major product you can control by either using a skinny or a bulky base. The bulky bases were so fat that they could not reach the more crowded hydrogen, and they would reach the less crowded hydrogen, the, the hydrogen on the carbon that's less substituted. This, that's the bulky bases. And the skinny bases would be able to reach in here because that would create the more stable, and here I'll whip out a... Uh, technical term that you should remember, the more stable Zaitsev product. Hmm, more stable Zaitsev product. The skinny bases used to steal the more stable Zaitsev product, and the bulky bases used to steal the less stable, and the technical term for that less stable, less substituted product was the, not the Zaitsev product, but the Hoffman product. The plot thickens. So bulky bases would steal the, the Hoffman product. The problem is, in when you're doing, when you form these quaternary ammonium salts, look at this thing. It's enormous. It's so bulky all by itself. You don't need a base to be bulky. Your substrate is bulky. And, and that doesn't matter what base you use. Because this is so bulky, even if you have a skinny base, the base is going to have a hard time reaching a more crowded carbon. And it will always steal the less substituted hydrogen. 
so the space would steal this hydrogen, those electrons would go toward the leaving group and kick the leaving group off in a classic E2 mechanism. So what you'd end up with there is what was the quaternary ammonium salt becomes trimethylamine and it separates from this carbon chain which becomes so we don't take off this other beta hydrogen it's too crowded over there so the hydrogen leaves to form water here So we have water, and finally, here, these electrons move over and create this pi bond. Now, this bond here, those electrons went on the nitrogen. There are those lone pairs now. And so we end up with an alkene. So notice the overall thing we had to do. Oh, and this also it speeds up if you add a little heat here with this silver oxide and, uh, and water. So notice the overall transformation that we made occur. We took our amine, we treated it with excess methyl iodide, that turned it into a quaternary ammonium salt. And then we added silver oxide, Ag2O, the silver steals away the iodine so that the ammonium isn't stable anymore, and if we mix that with water, the oxygen will turn into hydroxide, which can act as a base to do the elimination reaction, and it'll happen especially fast if we add heat as well. And ultimately, we turned our amine into an alkene. We eliminated the amine, and we added a pi bond. And that's a classic elimination reaction. So, the one last thing to note here, crucial thing to note, is the pi bond always forms toward the less crowded carbon. You always get the Hoffman product. And if you don't know what that means, again, I encourage you to review in detail the videos that I've created for those for the Organic Chemistry One people. The Hoffman product is the less substituted product. You could imagine, if you go back here, theoretically, you could have imagined forming, if you had something like this, You could have imagined having your alpha carbon where the leaving group was, your beta carbons before it. When this leaves, oops, when that leaves, you could imagine stealing the hydrogen on the left and getting the product that we did, or stealing the hydrogen on the right and getting that product. Comparing those, Notice that the alkene on the left, where we actually formed it, only has one alkyl chain, one carbon chain, coming off of the atoms in the double bond. In organic one, we describe that as monosubstituted. In the other one, there are two carbon chains coming off of the carbons in the double bond. In organic one, we call that disubstituted. The less substituted product is the Hoffman product. That's the product we will always get when we do the Hoffman elimination with an amine because we first form that quaternary ammonium salt that's so bulky that even skinny bases can't reach the more the hydrogen on the more substituted beta carbon that would otherwise give you the Zaitsev product. So in this video we talked about the Hoffman elimination. You can take any amine and turn it into an alkene by first treating it with excess ammonium iodide followed by silver oxide, water, and heat, and the double bond that you form will always be the less substituted of all the possibilities. It will, the double bond will always go toward the least crowded carbon.